Welcome to this Baptist News Global Webinar. Here's your host, Mark Wingfield. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Wingfield, Executive Director of Baptist News Global, and I'm delighted to introduce you today to my friend, Dr. Emily Smith. And this is her new book that's coming out next week, uh, The Science of the Good Samaritan. That's what it looks like. <clears throat> uh, fortunate to have an advanced copy with me. And if you're wondering about the beautiful wallpaper behind me, uh, I am broadcasting to you today from the Panera Bread Company in Watauga, Texas. Um, <laughs> not from my dining room table uh, at home, where I usually am. Something I have in common with uh, Emily, where she wrote uh, a good part of the book, I think, was at your dining room table, you said. That is uh, right. Not at Panera. Yeah. <laughs> not at Panera. Not my normal haunt here. Uh, <laughs> but we have to do what we can to make our schedules work. So uh, we're going to have a conversation for a while. And... I invite you throughout the um, conversation to use the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, okay. Uh, use the Q&A at the bottom and start loading in some questions, and we're going to get to those as we go along the way. So uh, by way of introduction, I need to say that Emily and I first met during the pandemic uh, yeah. when she was in Waco uh, working and teaching at Baylor just down the road, but because of the pandemic, we never met in person. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, B&G ran several stories uh, on her work as your friendly neighborhood epidemiologist, which is her blog. And uh, we just came to appreciate each other um, during that time. And now she's off to North Carolina, uh, back at Duke. Uh, and she'll say more about that in a minute. But uh, again, the book we're gonna be talking about is this one, The Science of the Good Samaritan. And it, it is a thick book. Now, it's it's not in eight-point type, at least, uh, right? Um, right? And we'll, I'll ask you in this in a minute, but uh, this seems to me to be sort of a cross between an academic book and a lay, lay read book, right? We'll talk about that audience. Um, yeah. So don't be daunted by this. And, and it's got a whole bunch of chapters. Uh, in it but they're brief <laughs> they're they're not they're not 50 page chapters right so you can this is accessible right this is accessible yeah. to everyone good let's say that up front right thank you uh, yeah um so emily let's talk first about just your educational training because you have a unique set of skills and interests that, that come together. Like I've never met yeah. someone like you before, right? So yeah. to help us understand the intersection of the things that you care about. Yeah, yep. Well, I said, oh, good. Maybe that's good. Then maybe that's, well, wow, that's unique. <laughs> that's totally fine. Thank you also, before I forget about the book, um, about it being a cross between academic and lay, I, yes to all of that. I, you know, it's we'll talk more of what the book is about, I'm sure, later, but um, but I did want it to be accessible. And we did have to cut several chapters from it because I tend to be, I was just wordy, <laughs> which is fine. But if you pre-order the book, you get one of those chapters um, for free that you can go get now on the website. So if anybody has, go download that. Um, I grew up in a just a tiny wonderful town in southeastern New Mexico is 10 miles from the Texas border, like West Texas. So we were West Texas culture, you know, flatlands and oil field. And, um, but I just loved it. Grew up in the church. My parents were worship leaders um, for most of my life and at a small church there. And, and we also were the host family for missionaries that came to speak. And so I would get kicked out of my room, which was totally fine. Um, and give them that. But then most of the time I could, you know, over dinner or after dinner, just drill them with eight-year-old questions about what are you doing? You know, where have you traveled? I just remember being incredibly enamored by it. Um, I remember in, and this picture is in the book as well, because I just wanted to make it a little more personal. Um, I wanted to be a missionary growing up and Sandy Patty, which, you know, haven't done either, which is fine. I actually wrote her a letter <laughs> when I was 10 and never heard back. It was fine. We're still holding out for it. Um, but the the want to do something in the globe that would help people has always been something that I've just wanted to do. Um, and I actually, I, I thought the only way you could do that was through medical school. 
And so I was pre-med at Wayland Baptist University in the Panhandle of Texas. What a great place to go. Um, I know Marv Knox is on here and he's got connections there with his family. So I'll embarrass to say hi, Marv and Joe. I met my husband there. So it's just a lovely, I just, it's just a great place to go to school. But I was pre-med um, with a minor in chemistry. And the year before I graduated that summer, I went to Honduras on the Mercy Ships. Many people are familiar with that. And that was, that was my first stint out of the U.S., um, my first really look into the world of poverty. And I noticed there that I was asking questions that were different than medical. You know, the medical field or dentist or PAs or nurses, they ask the questions of like one-on-one -on -one treatment. And I noticed I was asking questions about poverty or why is this group of children so sick with pneumonia, but this isn't, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but that's epidemiology. Um, and so I came back home, took the MCAT, got into medical school, but my husband, we got married straight out of college. Uh, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary and his first job, he's a pastor, was all the way across the country. Um, I had a gap year where I was going to go to medical school and decided I'm a nerd. Why not get another degree? And so I enrolled in getting an MPH and day one of epidemiology, which I hadn't really heard of the time. I just recognized, oh, this is, this is just me. It fits what I was asking. So I pivoted and got a PhD instead. Oh, I think you're on mute, Mark. I did myself because I'm at Panera Bread. Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's right. lunchtime. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's a beautiful story. So this intersection of being raised in, now I have a theory as a, a New Mexican uh, <laughs> that uh, West Texas and Southeastern New Mexico ought to be their own state. Uh, sure, that's kind know, of accurate, yeah. <laughs> they have more in common with each other than with the states where they reside. Uh, yes. Anyhow, that's a side note to that. Yes. But that mix of faith that. and science has been early in life for yeah. you, right? Early, early yeah. in life. And, um, you know, this is a an ongoing challenge. I mean, you d did you understand that you were just by combining those two things that you were walking into the lion's den. Did you know that early on? No, at all. And I, you know, in a way, I'm kind of grateful for that because I probably wouldn't have done what I did during the pandemic. Um, but I, it's always just been one and for me. I, mm. I am very motivated by my faith to help, and my science seems to be a depiction of that. You know, I remember in day one of hearing. Uh, epidemiology, when he was describing it, you know, if you want to get jeopardy about it, it's the determinants and distribution of disease. So what makes a disease spread and who is most at risk? And I remember thinking in that class, oh, that's the science of the Good Samaritan. It's quantifying who is most at need and then choosing not to walk by. So it just is natural to me. I didn't, I don't think I talked about faith and science as two distinct entities and then mm. coming together because they were so intertwined. But also I was really careful because I didn't want people that I met who were not of the Christian faith to feel like I, they were a project to me or mm. evangelism. I just get so uncomfortable, um, which you see that through the book too. The book, I yeah. talk about my experience as the Christian, but it is not centered around Christianity. So that's a long way to say I was really surprised at that. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So you you saw it as the as a as the same thing. I mean, they're they're part of a whole. Thing yeah, science, at least right? for me, on a personal, that was my way to just act like Jesus in the world was through data and epidemiology. So it it's so it's hard to even disentangle when I was writing the book because it feels so in, interrelated. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, right right down the road from where I'm sitting right now, as I was driving up here. Uh, I drove by this big building, and the sign says "Biblical Planetarium." Oh, <laughs> Biblical Planetarium, and I sort yeah. of want to go in and see what that's about. Well, uh, me but too. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what it's about. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> so before we get to COVID, which is a big yeah. motivator for the, the book and where this comes from, but not yeah. exclusively, uh, I want to talk about another communicable disease, and that's Ebola. Yeah. And this plays a big part in your story. And many of our readers know that this is a part of my story too, 
because for 17 years, I was the associate pastor at Wilshire Baptist Church in Dallas, and we were the Ebola church here in yeah. Dallas, because uh, when we had the first known case of Ebola in the United States, in Dallas, the gentleman who came from Liberia, uh, his fiance was a member of our church. Yeah. And when he arrived and was infected, but didn't know he was infected, he was staying at her small apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will never forget the call I got from our senior pastor. Uh, I think it was on a Thursday morning saying, we've got a problem. We've got to get ahead of this yeah. uh, because it had just come out that uh, here's this member of our church who has a man with Ebola staying at her apartment. And, and, and we, we had to get quickly educated and get up to speed and then, we became educators for the community, sure. right? Yeah. Because no one understood this. And we literally had people not coming to church, not sending their kids to our uh, early childhood learning center. I had a food truck operator who refused to come do a food truck event at our church because he was afraid his staff would get Ebola. And mm -hmm. this man had never, ever stepped foot in our building. And his fiance had not been there since he'd been in town. So there was no physical connection at all, except that ultimately our senior pastor, George Mason, was visiting uh, Louise and her family in isolation, but mm -hmm. keeping a distance from them, right? He's he's the only person, the only person other than the county judge executive who was who visited them during their weeks in isolation uh, yeah. from this. So uh, we understand that fear that is just so instantaneous and, that's part of your story too in the book because you have a whole chapter on on Ebola, mm -hmm. and how does that set up? You know that that just seems so distant for most Americans, but really, it, it right. wasn't right. Right, and the only reason it's it feels distant is because we had the healthcare capability to take care of it. You know, Ebola is not highly highly fatal. Um, it is where you don't have good supportive care, uh, which is where, why you saw, you know, the teen epidemic just went crazy in those um, those countries. You know, it's in my book because it, it's that chapter is about how do we value a life? How do we determine the worth of who is worthy to receive health care and who isn't? Um, so that same story that you're talking about there was one of the, he's kind of like the Dr. Fauci of, mm. of Africa. Very, very, Dr. Khan, incredibly well-known, very well-respected. Years before the epidemic, he actually worked with some really well-known global health um, advocates in the States and in the UK to, you know, to be prepared in case an epidemic did happen in their country, Sierra Leone, uh, West Africa. And a little bit was done, but certainly not much. So then it hit. Well, he becomes um, infected with it. Um, and so he, you can read the whole story, but he, uh, he was, they were asking to be medevaced, you know, someplace different. So they took him to a, a facility that had somewhat of a better capacity to take care of him. Um, and they also had what's called ZMAP. Now ZMAP is, it, it's an experimental drug. It was at the time. But it was the only somewhat cure that someone could get. And for those just listening and not watching, I did air quotes to cure. Because <laughs> uh, it was still experimental. And so there's only a certain number of vials in the world of that. So there was this very on-the-ground distinction of who gets that and who doesn't. Um, it's, it's really complicated. We don't have time to go through all of that. But long story short, he did not end up getting it. And he ended up dying a couple of days later um, at that facility all by himself. There was one friend there who asked to be able to go in and just be with him mm -hmm. at the end. Uh, you go about 400 miles away to another country um, to other people who were sick with Ebola. Uh, kind of same scenario. I mean, you're just really, really sick with it. They did get Zima. And so the question of who got it, who didn't, who gets to decide who got it or who didn't. Um, those two people that um, that contracted Ebola at the same time around Dr. Khan did, they were actually medevaced in this incredibly state-of-the-art, looks like a sci-fi airplane to the US. We probably remember that on the news, um, you know, full hazmat suit to go to 
uh, to get better, and they did get better. They received ZMAP and incredible supportive care with a team of, you know, more than 10 just for them um, and walked out of the hospital. And so it, the, the distinction in that chapter is not on do we have to pick. The point is I wish we didn't have to pick who mm. got ZMAP or who gets oxygen or who gets, you know, food help or I don't know, pick whatever it is that we would want for our own families. So I think for people to wrestle with that helps us be better neighbors. Right. Um, so several things you've pointed out of there that are relevant to larger conversation. One is our mm, lack of interest in caring about something until it touches us. Yeah. Uh, right. That's one theme there. And then the the ethical, moral decisions of who gets treatment and who gets prevention even yeah right um in these things and out of sight out of mind is really right for us and, and i i have to note that uh i mean you begin the book uh with a whole bunch of disclaimers <laughs> yes, <laughs> about sure. who you are and the privilege you have and, and all of those things uh in in the forward like i'm flipping to it madly right now right but the the last line that you say there is although I have worked hard to decolonize my work in my heart, it is a work in progress. Yeah. I think all of us could absolutely say that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. or, whether we would or not, but we could. Um, it, it's a work in progress. Right. Um, right. right. How, 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 did, how did that work begin in your heart? I mean, I think I, I think my personality is fairly tender anyways, um, really very empathetic. So I tend to gravitate to the margins and to those that are on the side of the road anyways. I always have. You know, my mom told me that for years. She just remembers that as a little girl. Um, so I think that that was my natural inclination. I think where the rubber hit the road on how did... I guess, how did it become a little bit more vocal was probably during COVID. Yeah. You know, I, until then, I had been just as normal as can be, 38 years old, mama two, have a golden retriever dog, married to a pastor. <laughs> I mean, just normal, normal, normal. And then the, the cost of what that would look like on a bigger scale, I think that really hit. Um, but I've always just wanted to help in whatever way I could. So you, you, you began your blog at that point, right? The, the, the yeah. blog didn't, did not exist before COVID, right? No, I tell people all the time when they ask, how did you become an influencer? And I just tell them, don't do it. <laughs> Unless it's going to be for like makeup or something really normal. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, in 2020, I went to, I spoke at two um, big conferences right when Wuhan was happening. And so there were a lot of people asking questions of, you know, what do we need to pay attention? And then when I went back home, um, I had just my life neighbors and people in my family asking, what does flatten the curve mean? Uh, kind of, I mean, and I want to acknowledge that fear, you know, fear of if Ebola was here or uh, with hearing about COVID, it's a, it's a real legitimate fear. And so I was feeling it too with my kids. Um, and so I started the blog when more than like three people were asking me, you know, about flatten the curve <laughs> right. or should we really buy a billion things of toilet paper, which the answer was no. But when I started that, I named it friendly neighbor epidemiologist, just off the cuff because friendly, I, I am over friendly. Um, I reckon that's just who I am. So I'm, I'm trying to embrace it more and then neighbor because COVID was going to be different than Ebola where you are infectious before you even knew that you were sick. I'm sorry, let me, you were contagious before you knew you were sick. Right. Um, and so with Ebola, it's pretty, uh, you know who is sick, um, even though it spreads really easy. So it would take it would take us coming around one another to actually protect one another as neighbors. Uh, and I just thought this was going to be the time for the church to really shine too, mm. with just the solidarity of love for neighbor. But I didn't start it for the church. I started it for just to be global neighbors with one another. And, you know, my day job is to work in places like Somaliland and Burundi on poverty and children's health. 
So I had known history enough about global health that I knew how Americans were going to act mm. and hopefully act would affect our friends and neighbors in Somaliland and Burundi. Yeah. So I know I started at the beginning and then it just caught on. My son the other night said, Mom, do you remember when you had like 50,000 people? <laughs> <laughs> I said, buddy, I remember when it hit 500 and I couldn't do the comments anymore. So it just seemed to to take on, especially when George Floyd was murdered um, and yeah. how that we needed to talk about that as a as global neighbors. Um, and then when January 6th happened in the church, the messiness with faith over fear, I spoke really directly into that. And that really, I think those went viral. So uh, what what was the peak of, of your followership at, at that point? Was it 50,000? Was it more than that? No, uh, no, it, it's peaked at 106 and it's just been steady since. Oh, wow. I mean, and that's, that's really... just on just just on Facebook, I've just got on Facebook. Yeah, several, that's yeah. amazing. So you you just pointed out a really important thing that we need to not forget, and that is there was a confluence of multiple events happening at the same time. Yes, I mean twenty twenty is sort of like nineteen sixty three, um, sure. uh, and a few years, some of that those periods. So you had COVID, <laughs> uh, and you had the George Floyd uh, and the racial reckoning stuff, and then you had yeah. the presidential election on top of that. Right. And then you end up with January 6th, you're right in the new year. And all of these things are like a stacked enchilada, you know, they're just uh, not not the delicious kind uh, either. Yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so but you so you you set out to do something good and helpful, but you pretty quickly ran into a buzzsaw, too. Right. Uh, wh when did the opposition begin? It started pretty early on because I I very naively would write about I was also trying to help pastors, married to a pastor, mm -hmm. so I understand, you know, how do you tell your congregations and really mobilize them to wear your mask and trust the vaccines? And um, so the when I started hearing, you know, have faith, not fear, which was code in some places to don't wear your mask. Right. Trust the Lord. I was like, hold up, that is wacky Bible. I just couldn't understand it. And so I wrote a, a, a thing about it. Um, and that to, to just to help pastors when you're preaching, please incorporate faith over fear actually means Galatians, Galatians first, or go to the Good Samaritan story. Uh, so that was the first time where the backlash happened. And around that time is when we got our first threat at the house. Um, you know, where that that by far has got to be the scariest mm. day ever because it's it was just written in you know red and uh, black marker and it was fraught with mark of the beast and awful stuff about my family and my kids and so that was that was kind of a rude awakening to oh there are a group of people who are incredibly active um, in this opposition uh, and so that. But I I just kept talking about it because I thought at some point this has got to stop, <laughs> yeah. and it, it got worse. Um, and the middle of the book is the cost section because mm -hmm. I just wanted people to be more prepared than what I was about when you start acting and talking like a neighbor, it could cost something, and it's, it's okay, but just be aware of it. Right. So I mean, you had actual death threats, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Worked with. Worked with authorities. Awful. We can't let our kids go walk in the neighborhood anymore. Um, they knew whose houses to go to if something didn't. And we were really nonchalant about that so that they weren't scared. But, you know, if you ever be comfortable and just run into Jeremy Everett's house. I know you know Jeremy well. Because right. what we were also starting to get is some... Um, awful harassment from people that we were shipped with or that were in our own neighborhood. And that's when it got even more scary because anybody can send a picture of a gun, which take this seriously. Yes, right. we did. Uh, when it comes from clothes, that was really, really scary. And it also showed me how, you know, I don't, I don't think that that Christian nationalism is fringe. I've heard a couple of people say that. I absolutely do not think it's fringe. Because we saw it in just our little neighborhood. 
Yeah. Well, so you were in Waco, Texas at the time this was right. going on. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with Texas, Waco is in central Texas. It's where Baylor University is. So it's a big college town, but mm -hmm. it's very, it's very much like Texas in that it's a very divided uh, kind of place between right. uh, red and blue and r religion. And uh, it, it has, you know, uh, everything there. Um, you know, it's, it's it's where the Branch Davidian compound was, uh, just coincidentally. But it's also you know the center of uh, of higher education, and so you have just this intense mix of people. Yeah. But what I remember from our earlier conversations is some of the people who were very upset with you were not uneducated people. They were not uh, normally mean people. They just didn't believe what you were saying. Yeah. Right. And then it, some, sometimes you got the pastors in the area or the town or the um, state. That was very surprising to me. Um, and it, it was more than just surprising. It was devastating because I, I hadn't really had losses like that. You know, losses of friendship, uh, loss of a faith community, loss of some family, loss of, I mean, it felt like it was just all unraveling um, in very distinct form for, for myself and my children and my husband. And that, you know, the cost is all of us. Well, and, and your husband, uh, I mean, faced difficulty with this in, in the church where y'all were attending, where he was serving, right? It, yeah. it, it, it affected every area of your life. Every area. Yep, every area. And then it got to Easter of 2021, where my body just said no more um, and just gave out on me completely. I, I never had, I, I forgot to take my multivitamins before 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I want to be really, uh, I'm very grateful to not have any type of chronic condition at all before that. And then it just, you know, the week after Easter, I was, I just got what they called an unrelenting chronic migraine mm. and it just did not let up for months and months and months. Yeah. So the cost is, I mean, it felt like I was holding on to that rope of identity or faith foundation. Um, and then when the health gave way, it's just, it all just yeah. fell apart. Well, you were driving hard through the storm yeah. and right. concentrating on what you had to do in that moment as many people were during, during COVID, but you especially, and then you finally come out and, you know, it's then, then the trauma hits, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Had I seen it coming, uh, maybe I could have done something. I don't know. I mean, there's yeah. only so much our bodies can hold with that type of level of, you know, daily. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 answer this question at whatever level you want to. And this is a prying question, but um, yeah. on the other side of this now, Mm -hmm. What do your kids remember about this and what do they see of it? What's their perspective? Oh, gosh. Well, this part will make me cry. <laughs> they were they were nine and 12 when we started. You know, I, we ask them in really super nonchalant form over lasagna or something. Hey, what do you remember about the TV and mom? And, um they don't let it, they haven't said anything that would indicate they heard more than what I would want them to hear. Mm. At the same time, they knew that they were not allowed to go certain places or hang out with friends anymore, but they just didn't know why. Because they're, because the other friends' parents. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, we will see, I think, ramifications of that with it's yeah so we've it, talked a lot about the, the the negative reaction yeah but obviously you had a lot of positive and, and it's very clear you helped people as well yeah. what, what's some of the positive response that you got and and how this maybe helped people see things in a new way yes and i was just about to go there with the kids too okay. because if anything it has been incredible conversations with them uh Guys, when you say this about Jesus, or when you stand up for your neighbors, or yeah. um, whatever, uh, it will be a cost. But that's okay. Let's let's role play through that of what you're going to mm. say if somebody says something. So I think it's I think it's given them a little bit more courage. They've also seen their mom, who 
is not naturally bold um, and friendly, get up and say some things that have made a lot of people mad. And we talk through that. So in that, in that, I think my kids are getting a little bit more resilience than what I had as a kid. Yeah. Wow. So some yeah. of the positive response from others. Yes. The other positive response, you know, right about the time of the January 6th riot, I wrote a uh, one that went really viral. I wrote a post called The Messy Thread on this weird intersection of what you mentioned, you know, racism, yeah. masking and nationalism, all of that. Um, and at that point, I saw the FNE, the Friendly Neighbor Epidemiology Community, split into three different groups. One of them was the science group, which was about 50% followers um, of a very different faith or not. I'm like, I totally fine. Relate with but then I saw the Christian faith group um, split into two different, and one of them just dug their their heels in more to, we're not going to wear a mask, we're going to believe all the wackadoodle stuff that they see on Facebook. The other one were a group that said, I have never seen systemic racism before, or I've never heard of structural violence, or I've never seen poverty, or fill in the blank, what do I do now? It was like they were hanging on for, then how do I be a good neighbor now that I know what I know or see what I see, including in the church or just you know in their own community? And the book is because of that. The book is the well, what's next? You know, how do we understand these buzzwords? I've got a, a chapter in there um, called things evangelicals don't want to talk about, which is like climate change or systemic racism or socialism and poverty, um, structural violence. Because I think when we understand those words, I think when we hold them up to the sky, they reflect heaven. One of the biggest weeks of harassment I got was the first time I talked about equity. And I was blown away by it because I thought, gosh, equity to me is a holy word of uh, that Ephesians verse about the foot of the cross is level, or it should be, um, or with the pictures of heaven that you see in relation, uh, Revelation 21, it feels very leveling, um, or the world just feels flipped upside down where we start at the margins. So I wanted to write a book about that, about what's next. So the first part of the book is all about that on centering. Which means, yes, we can, you know, give money to a food pantry or sponsor a child or all those things that a lot of people are already doing. But and also, what does the rest of our life look like in terms of neighboring? So it goes through a lot of history on understanding those code words like systemic racism or structural violence. I think to help us get a foundation to be neighboring, because I I, if we don't get our hearts and our posture right, if we're not centered correctly, like I think what Jesus did. Um, we will do good works, but I don't know if it will be as long lasting as it could be if it's actually how Jesus did it. You know, when he's in the Bible, when he centered little kiddos um, or he stopped the entire crowd because of the bleeding woman or he centered the lepers, you know, these he, he flipped who should be in the middle of our attention on his head. And I think when we do that, too in today's world, which is like margins and poverty, um, I think we can be better global neighbors. So the, the whole theme of loving neighbor comes from the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and it's not unique to Jesus, but in, in our tradition, this is a big part of Jesus uh, mm -hmm. and, and what we learned. And like you, I was surprised during the pandemic, particularly to understand that a lot of Christians don't really believe that. Um, and so the scriptural reference, Jesus says, the first commandment is to love the Lord, your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And the second is like it to love your neighbors yourself. And I, I, I ran into pastors who would say, yeah, but the first one's more important. We, we've got, we've got to worship in person together to love God. That's more important than loving our neighbor. That's second because Jesus said that second. Right. And I've, like I, I had never heard this kind of theology in my life. And that's yeah. part of what you're right. Like, I, I thought it was essential to Christianity to love your neighbor. Yes. Right? But apparently not. Right. Right. And, and disentangling why that was so hard for people. Um, I, I did not do it in, in its entirety because I, I don't 
know if I had it in me to write an entire book about that. <laughs> but I think disentangling that helps us be better neighbors. And, you know, when you go and look at that Good Samaritan story, the two people that walked by were symbolic of the power and the privilege of the time. The Samaritan that actually stopped, I mean, you, there's a whole book I'm sure you could write about the significance of that, of who he was in that society. But I wanted to center who was on the side of the road and what that man did in response. The and also is he helped those that man's acute needs. And also he took him to a place to go get uh, more help. And then he paid for it all. To me, that's the and it's going to cost us something. It's the and also of of neighboring. And I also wanted to, you know, at the beginning of the book, um, when you pull it up, you have this, you went up, oh, well, that didn't work at all. <laughs> Sorry about that. At the beginning of the book, I have you shall, uh, that story, love your neighbor as yourself by Jesus. And then where that is actually also threaded through the other major religions of the world. Um, so it's not Christian specific. This book is not centered on you have to be a Christian. It's also not centered on you have to be a person of faith to just believe in that loving your neighbor sentiment. At the very bottom of that list is um, being a good neighbor. That's just a good human. My kid, age nine, that was my youngest. And he said that during the pandemic when he just couldn't understand why people weren't understanding love your neighbor. So I think it's that's a long way to say I think it's pervasive on people just wanting to be good people in the world today. Well, so I, I'm with you on that. And that's, I mean, I grew up that way. Uh, I was taught that in church. I was taught that at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And I grew up in a, like you, I grew up in a very conservative uh, Southern Baptist kind of environment, but we somehow have gotten to a point where uh, these yeah. things are seen differently. And even to this day, um, you know, I, I I got lambasted on Twitter yesterday for a news article uh, about a particular person who comes out of the ultra conservative, there's no other word for it, uh, Southern Baptist tradition uh, of extreme Calvinism um, and is doing some stuff, is an abortion abolitionist. Uh, and yet the very people who are touting this don't want to be called that, right? Because they've redefined what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. They're the Christian, and we're not. And we saw this in people like John MacArthur, uh, yeah. you know, who just defiantly refused to uh, follow health mandates and ended up spreading COVID through his entire church. But yet he got a big settlement from the state of California because they, he accused them of wrongly, you know, persecuting him. And some days it feels like the world's upside down, right? Sure. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And I think that there are people who are just going to stick their heels in even further. And, you know, the wisdom, at least for me, has been who to just mute, block and delete and then who to keep listening to to not be so distracted. One of my favorite chapters from a faith perspective is at the end um, in the courage section, like a good Baptist I named the section centering cost and courage with three C's. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. That uh, pastor's wife there, but the courage, it was courage, at least for me to not pay attention to certain voices, even as hard as it was. And so it's the story of Nehemiah, you know, when he says um, at the end of chapter one, I'm a cupbearer to the king. And in, I've always loved that verse in my Bible, you can actually see where I've dated it. You know, I'm a new mom. 20, uh, 2008, I'm a PhD student instead of a cup bearer. But then he goes and he's rebuilding the wall. And then you've got the two Sanballat and Tobiah come up and try to say, people are speaking against you, you know, come on down and let's revenge yourself. Basically that's for all you pastors out there. Let me just have that. <laughs> that's from, that is not verbatim. NIV. But he didn't take the bite in the bait. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. So they came in with another sneak attack and said, how about you just come and let's just have coffee and talk about what you're doing. This is later on in the story. And he says, um, I'm doing a great work and I'm not going to come down. Mm. That is such an anchor for me to not get distracted by voices I don't need to be distracted about or fights that I don't need to enter. Because I think we're, we are only, uh, we only have so much we can do ourselves. And, and yet, um, yeah. 
the Enneagram eight in me wants to say, uh, you, this is a call to action. Uh, yes. the, the book is a call to love your neighbor actively, not just in theory, right? Because yes. where you're getting in this is go do these things, go and do likewise, right? Yes. Uh, and I, 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 am I wrong in saying that I think that's the point of the book is you're you're trying to encourage people uh, to take a risk and to get involved yes. in right? Is that is that the yes, point? it is. And the courage, the Nehemiah type courage is the wisdom to know what is my good work and what isn't. Because for a lot of us, when we started seeing uh, systemic racism, and then you have climate change, and then I talk about poverty and children's health, and you can't do it all, but I can do what I can do. So it is a call to action, but not a call to exhaustion. <laughs> I'm trying mm. to fight too many battles of, you know, we're not white saviors, um, and to root that out of us. That's a great line. It's a call to action, not a call to exhaustion. Well, I lived it. I mean, I, I just, my body just said no. Uh, but the wisdom of, I can't, I, there are certain fights on Twitter that I just will not talk to, talk about anymore. Uh, but then there are other fights that you better believe I'm going to jump into. Right. Yeah. The wisdom to know the difference. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess that's a good lead into this next thought. And that is, you know, what next? Uh, yeah. And interestingly, even as we're talking, there's a resurgence of COVID. Uh, you know, uh, you might say a word about how we're always going to live with COVID at, at this point forward. It's like never going to be gone from us, right? What Putting on your epidemiologist hat. Yeah. Uh, wh where are we in the world of COVID now? Oh, man. I don't, and just to let people know, too, the book is not about COVID because I just don't have it in me to talk about it for two <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, and in a, in a sense, we are past the scary, the scariest part of it, unless we've got some funky variant that pops up um, that evades, you know, vaccines. But I think we're, this is going to be with us for a while. If we had done the tried and true playbook, the epidemiology playbook, we could have squashed it earlier. Um, we did not do that globally. So it's going to be here for a while. It, you know, I think about it as like it could have been a roller coaster real quick and then real far um, or real swift down right. but because that's lengthened out that tail is going to be longer than it should be so it'll be a while i mean get your vaccines uh, these upticks that we're seeing right now wear a mask you know and airplanes i just always wear a mask yeah. Costco on a saturday <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me remind everyone uh, this is a good time if you've not put in a question uh Type in a question. We're going to get to those here in just a moment. We're, we're about to that point in the um, webinar. So we'd love to have your questions on here. And some have asked, is this webinar being recorded? Yes, it will be posted probably later today uh, on our website, on our YouTube channel. And then we'll also have a news story out of it uh, as well. So lots of ways to share this information with others. And that's the whole point is whoever's attending today, you're like our live audience uh, yes. so that we can broadcast this later. Uh, to, to other people. So uh, the, the the book is not officially out yet. It's coming out next week, yeah. right? But yeah. I, what's the pre-buzz like? What kind of response are you getting? I'm told, I mean, this is my first book, so I'm leaning on the, the publishing people that are the experts. I'm told it's really good, which I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful about, you know, it was, it was a little risky to not go full devotional or full academic book. So I hope that, I hope people laugh through it because there's a lot of personal stories. Um, I believe in the power story and rooting out racism or solid, helping people with solidarity. Um, so I hope it makes people laugh. But so far, the book is great. When it first came out, I took a screenshot of, or when the pre-order first came out um, on Amazon, and you know, it, it was hitting number one in all three of my categories. And then it hit the top 500 on Amazon, which there's a lot of books on Amazon. <laughs> so that I'm really grateful. It seems like it is striking a chord with people who just want to be real good neighbors, which is exciting. So your husband is a discipleship and education guy who yes. cares about these types of things. From that lens, how <laughs> might this book be used in small groups, uh, in Sunday school groups or other, other groups? Uh, book study groups, how would you envision people yeah. being able to use this? Yeah, thank you for that. 
I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that if it didn't get asked. Uh, we are about, we're going to, when it comes out, we're going to release a study guide that could be for book clubs that are non-faith um, or non-Christian faith, or it could be, you know, you can use it within a, a Christian church. So there'll be two different options. Um, but I think people could definitely use it in a, a book club or a Sunday school or a Wednesday night, you know, a couple of month type thing. I did try to give some questions to help guide that discussion. Um, for the Christian space, I gave some of the verses that I think would be good per chapter to go look at. So I th if anything, what I have heard from some people that have already read it that I very much trust is they, one, one person said, I have never understood systemic racism until I read that chapter about your baby being born. Um, and then I didn't understand what structural violence was until I read that chapter about the 1885 horseshoe table. These are little tidbits that I can give you. Those are stories that I loved to tell, probably because I'm an overshare, but also because the history, understanding the history impacts what we do today. Um, but I also wanted to make it accessible to people. So I definitely think it could be used in the church. Right. Let me read a question that we've got. Thank you so much for the book, but mostly for your courage. Um, please tell us about Amanda Ismail's and Paul Farmer's influence. One of the most meaningful quotes in my life is from Paul Farmer. Yeah. Um, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. Yeah. Hi, John. I'm reading that too. We've never met, but I know that you, I recognize your name from the Ethany community. So thank you for joining so Edna um, Adon Ismail is in chapter one, and she is throughout the whole book. She's the one who's taught me just by her life what centering looks like and what being a neighbor looks like. She is my main collab friend, is what I call her, um, from Somaliland. Um, she has her own book out, which is just lovely to read. But she has centered her entire life, life savings on helping her people in Somaliland, which is the fourth poorest country of the world. So I, I write about that and her influence. Um, we are 40 years apart in age. We are of two different faiths and just love each other. And so I, I think that neighboring does not have to be one or the other. Um, and she has taught me that. John, that's a great question. And then Paul, gosh, Dr. Paul Farmer, who I would have loved to give him this book. Um, you see in the book, you see a picture of him in one of the chapters I wrote specifically about him. He is the first person who taught me the word solidarity. Uh, he signed it in a book when I was a student in Solidarity Paul. And I just looked up that word. Um, and when he gave me, you know, 10 years later, his other book, he wrote the same words in solidarity. And we had known each other at this point, just in my, he did some global health work um, or I did some global health work. And then we knew each other from that. So he, he has just modeled the, and also of neighboring to me because he does a lot of work in tuberculosis. And what they were saying at the time is that people in, in Africa or in South America need to come to the clinics to get care. And, but the people weren't coming. Well, it's because they're of poverty or they've got a lot of children or they're really sick. So why not go to them? So he is flipping the, the script of, we're gonna start with the margins instead of making them come to us. It's just a very tangible way of living a life of neighboring. Um, but John, you will see Paul and Edna both throughout there. Edna's, Edna has a picture in there too. Okay, so I, I'm curious, you, you work not only in the United States, but you work with people around the world. So you have a global, some global connections. Yeah, you all also, of my research is global. Yeah. So on top of that, you work with students and graduate students, and so people younger than yourself. Uh, so I'm wondering what you see in those different universes where you work. How do they see this issue of neighbor? And yeah. is there any American versus the rest of the world perspective? Is there any younger versus older, middle-aged perspective? What? How does that shake out? Oh, I definitely think there is an American versus, or maybe a Western high income versus non-Western or global South, global North, however you want to say that. Um, I, there is, I think there is more of a recognition of 
us depending on one another and living in community and solidarity with one another. There's a quote in the book by Pope Francis. Um, I won't get it all right, but when we recognize the sacred in the other, then we take our shoes because we recognize the ground is holy. And I think that, that is more evident in places um, that are non-Western. <laughs> We're very individualistic here in the U.S., which the back part, the courage part of the book is talking about trickle up economics instead of trickle down, solidarity, flipping all of those capitalism type words on its head. Um, but with the younger generation, man, that they keep me bold because they're not afraid to call out white saviorism. Or when you're doing something not as a neighbor, like power structures, they will just call it out on the table. So I I just love them. And I see my kids do this too. It, it feels like it comes more natural to them to shake the, the tables that need to be shaken um, easier than my generation and up. I, yeah, that seems to resonate for sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything about the book that we've not talked about that, that you just are burning to say that I, I wasn't smart enough to ask you about? Oh, no, you did. <laughs> You're doing great, Mark. Um, no, I mean, I think, we, I think we covered it pretty well, the three sections, and it's just full of stories. Uh, and what I tell people is it's not a COVID book, which I've talked about. It's right. not a faith, Christian faith book. And what I didn't say is it's not a science book. So hopefully you won't be bored at like chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So we, we know what it's not now. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. Well, uh, Dr. Smith, we are so delighted to have had this conversation. It's been just fascinating and uh, all, always great to visit with you. We thank you again uh, for those watching. Uh, this is what the book looks like. So when you go order it, you know you're getting the right thing. Uh, this is it. I highly recommend it. And uh, it's got some great recommendations, uh, endorsements on it as well. Um, yeah. yeah. And published by Zonder, you know, so. Yeah. Look, uh, I'm thankful yeah. for that. That is an incredible team to work with. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we wish you the best on that. And it's great to catch up. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we've got uh, our next webinar. It's not yet been announced, but it's going to be with Greg Garrett, uh, our friend from Baylor University uh, and his his new book on James Baldwin. Uh, and that'll be coming in, in November. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about that as well. All right. Thanks, everyone. And goodbye. Support independent faith based journalism. Baptist News Global.